16 years as I reach back in time when this entire story began. It's another sunny day in Los Angeles and I'm getting ready for work. I work for the largest and most successful entertainment studio in the world. And despite my 60 hour work weeks, including sometimes weekends, with all the stress, anxiety, burnout, I try to remind myself constantly to be grateful that I even have a job. I graduated at a time after September 11th when most companies were firing or at a hiring freeze. So I tell myself, Leslie, you're one of 25 out of a candidate pool of 2,500. So be grateful. You have bills to pay. You have student loans to pay. Just get the work done. And that is my motivation to get me through to my work every day. As I make my way through the LA notorious bumper to bumper traffic, little do I know that this day which is a very big day. We have a big meeting with a very big producer with one of the biggest movie franchises in the world is going to set the trajectory of my life. Little did I know that similar to the main character in this movie, that I would be faced with a similar decision. Leslie, are you going to choose the blue pill or are you going to choose the red pill? Are you going to choose in this fabricated Hollywood lifestyle or will you choose a different path? So as I make my way down the streets of LA into the building, down all the luxury vehicles with their self-named parking spaces, the Beamers, the Mercedes, the Range Rovers, every day I dream to myself thinking, how much of my life do I have to sacrifice to get one of those? I make my way up to where I work I work in the international marketing for the movies and I realize I have about two hours until the big meeting. So I check my emails and as I'm working in the international department, I'm between time zones. I work in LA, but I'm working with Asia, Europe, Latin America, and I'm always constantly switched on. But in a way, it makes me feel connected to a world bigger than my little cubicle in Los Angeles. So eventually my boss comes and says, Leslie, are you ready? It's time for the meeting. And we make our way up to the other building. This is a time before smartphones, so people are actually conversating and talking to each other. And we arrive in the room, which is a huge dichotomy to this movie that we are marketing, an R-rated film. And we're about to meet with this big producer who I will call Mr. P, who is arrogant, um, known to be foul mouth, and just not a nice person. And here we are in this room with these PG rated movie posters, huge dichotomy for what's about to happen in this room. So we're waiting for Mr. P. And like I've been told most of the time, not all the time, he is running late. He walks in with his Hawaiian shirt, hairy chest as if he just come back from Hawaii, unapologetic for being late and immediately starts talking business without any small talk. And at first the meeting goes back and forth with some discussions, some updates about the movie and how to market it and what's been done with the studio filmmakers and himself. And then it comes to a point where it gets a bit aggressive. There's some discussion that gets a little bit heated and the energy you can feel is starting to feel a bit of fear intimidation, stress, anxiety, and he belittles these studio executives. I know how hard they work on this movie and in one fell swoop, he belittles them. And I think to myself, why do they allow him to speak to him like this? Why do they allow this to happen in this environment? And in just as quickly as I ask myself that question, I answer it myself and I think, well, because he makes a shitload of money for the studio. And so if you make a lot of money, supposedly wealth equals power. And as you're reared in the entertainment industry, it's all about butts and seats and eyeballs on screen. And as I sit there as an outsider looking in with all these filmmakers and studio executives on this oval table, and I'm not 
at the table with them, but very much the outsider against the wall, looking at them in their luxury designer threads with their luxury cars and their self-named parking spaces, I ask myself, is this the type of man that I'm willing to work for in five years? Would I be willing to, to bear my soul to work for somebody like this? And in that moment, and in my heart, I realize this is not for me. There's got to be another way for living and being and working in this world. Yes, I have bills to pay. I have massive amount of student loans, my rent, food to put on the table. But there's got to be another way than to live and work in this way. So even though in that moment I had no idea what was the next step I was going to do, where I was going to go, who I was going to do it with, when I was going to do it, a feeling of peace and calm and clarity came over me knowing that this is not for me and instead of living in this fabricated Hollywood lifestyle that I choose a different path. <coughs> that I choose the red pill. So I tell you this story, which actually is the beginning of my upcoming book, which I share more reflections and exercise to help you get to that point as well. I share this story with you because as I stand here before you 16 years later, if you had whispered to that 20 year something girl that in 16 years time you will be standing in front of people in Barcelona, with your French husband and two young children waiting at home for you, and you'll be speaking to these people about from passion to business, I would have died probably laughing. I, in business school, like cringed at the thought of speaking to people. When I was in business school and I had PowerPoint presentations, my hands were shaking, my mouth was dry, I was using my PowerPoints as a crutch, I was using my notes as a crutch, I wasn't connected in my body, I wasn't connected to my audience, and I wasn't connected to my message. And so I share this story because just like in our life, it's very similar with work. It's messy, it's overwhelming, it's frustrating. There's a whole spectrum of emotions that we go through in our life and in our work. So the question is, right, is how do you get there? How do you find your passion? Well, so often we are, you know, we're raised to believe that if we find our passion, we'll be happy, right? If we find it, then we'll live a life fulfilled, meaning, and, you know, set ourselves up for success. But, you know, often we look in the wrong places for our passion. We look either um, for other people's definition, we, maybe we take a personality test, we take a career assessment test, maybe we look in the self-help book aisle, or we look back in our childhood and we see what are the things that we enjoyed, what are the things that we loved. And while those are all beautiful places to get great insight, today I'd like to encourage you to look for your passion somewhere else. I encourage you to look for your passion in your suffering. So if you look at the definition of suffering, if you actually look in a dictionary, the original meaning is suffering. If you think about the passion of Christ and his suffering from the Last Supper to the time of his death, Suffering is actually the original definition of passion. But somehow we've evolved that definition of passion to that which we love. So the definition of passion actually has two meanings, suffering and love. And this is key information. You know, most of the people that I know that are doing something that they really love most of the time it's born out of their suffering. So as I shared in my story, 16 years ago and still you know, coming forward in, in my life in London, I had a life that was full of anxiety. I didn't know what I was doing. I had failed romantic relationships. My health was suffering. I had tons of death. 
I mean, there was so much suffering in that. But it's when I reframed my suffering and I started to heal it and I started to shift out and reframe it to thinking, what are the lessons that I can learn from my suffering? That this is ultimately what created a passionate life, my passion for me. So passion is not something that you need to seek outside yourself. And it's not something that will come immediately and it's not something that will you know, come in a FedEx package. It is something that you need to seek within yourself. So I encourage you not to do the personality test, to read the self-help books, to listen to other people's opinions and do the career assessment test, but actually look at your life. Where have you suffered? And in your suffering, you will find your passion. So I encourage you to ask yourself certain questions like, where have I experienced challenges? Where have things been difficult for me? Where have I experienced suffering? What are some of the things that have been running that I notice in my life? And then once you start to investigate your experience and your suffering, then ultimately you can start to reflect on what are, what are these challenges teaching me? What are the lessons that I have learned? What are the takeaways that I have come to realize when I reframe into an empowerment mindset instead of a victim mindset? And through this reframing of your suffering, can you find your passion? <coughs> you know, our life is full it's full of clues through your suffering. You know, as human beings, we learn through contrast. Pain versus joy, fear versus love. And it is in our human experience that this is what it's all about. How to evolve your suffering into love. So I encourage you to think about how you can evolve. How can you awaken that passion inside yourself by asking yourself those questions and reflecting on your own life. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, for me, I turned that suffering into a passion with everything that I learned and turned it into a career. But that doesn't have to be for everybody. Because when you heal, when you resolve and evolve your suffering into love, then you become more passionate about life in general, no matter what work it is you do, right? And true love is about who you are, who you've been and who you are becoming. True love is about you know, loving what you do, the people that you're with, and sharing that love wherever you go. So again, it's about reframing your suffering, reframing your suffering into a positive mindset about what can I learn from this, to always come from, I always have a choice, come from a non-beginner's, um, a beginner's mind, not always assuming that, you know, you always have the answer to everything. Because quite frankly, when I left the entertainment industry, I did start a business right away, co-founded a real estate company with one of my good friends and it was successful and then it failed because very much how I felt within myself was a reflection of how I was in my business. I felt I wasn't worthy. I felt that I wasn't good enough. I felt that I couldn't speak up and that what I had to say was not, was not important. And so I didn't communicate that with my business partner and it suffered. So how we are, how we feel about ourselves is a direct reflection of how we are in our business. So until we heal that suffering, until we actually become a student of our own life, can we really transform into this love, this passion to business? Everyone following so far? <laughs> okay. So 
When I moved from LA, never in my wildest dream did I think I'd meet my husband online, which is very taboo back then. This is before <laughs> Facebook and apps, um, 13 and a half years ago. Moved to London, and it wasn't until my own suffering that I had the loss of my best friend and my, my father, that I started to seek healing through my suffering. And I never intended to want to be a speaker and talk about this. I found the peace through practices such as meditation and yoga. I mean, that's how I found it. There's other ways that you can find that, you know, walk in nature, journal. But for me, that, those were the practices that helped to heal my suffering and transform it into love. And it was through my suffering, living in London, grieving the death of my, of my loved ones, inspired by seeing my father on hospice care, telling my husband finally, okay, yes, let's move to Barcelona. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? We move back. What's the worst that can happen? We enjoy the sun for a couple years. I mean, everything is figure outable. I mean, if you don't, what I always say and what I was thinking at that moment in Los Angeles is if your fear of not doing something is bigger than your fear of doing it, do it. So my fear of staying in that job, staying in that stifled, non-creative, intimidating environment was much bigger than my fear of leaving. I had no idea what I was going to do. And in fact, it took me about a year after that meeting to actually leave the entertainment industry. I didn't just pick up and leave and say, forget you all, I'm out of here. No, I you know, planned out like what were the steps I'm going to take, kept myself open to receive opportunities, meeting people, keep my eyes and ears open to you know, what can possibly, the possibility, basically. And then that's when the opportunity came forward to do this business with my friend. But even though it failed, I never believe that there is accidents in life. I always truly believe that everything we go through, especially through our suffering, is meant to bring us closer to our purpose. And our purpose is through our passion, right? So I encourage you to really just love your human experience. And through your experience that you may evolve and that you may heal your own suffering and transform it into love, into your life and into your business. Thank you. <laughs>